this podcast is all about happiness. What gave it away? <laughs> I'm Bayon Dixon and welcome to Happy Talk. Each week I will be introducing you to someone that I share happy connection with. I just believe that we all have happy stories, happy events, and we sit on them. We never share them. So this is the platform for doing it. I work as a presenter, broadcaster, events host. I work with stroke survivors. I have my own children's radio show. And I've been really lucky in the last 20 years to do work where I just ooze happiness. Yeah, I'm one of those people. My cup is eternally overflowing. Sit back, enjoy. It's time for Happy Talk. Welcome to Happy Talk with me, Bayon Dixon. Good news, good deaths, and no grief. Now, as I say, I am in the evening in my life, but my guest is in the daytime. It's Nikki Thomas coming in live and direct from Hamilton in New Zealand. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, 8 a.m. here. <laughs> just on 7 p.m. here. I mean, it's just so cool, isn't it? We literally are on the other side of the planet to each other. And it just feels like you're right there. I know. And actually, I'm a day ahead of you as well. That's what I can't get my head around as well. <laughs> it's You already have lived my day. I just love this. So is there anything I should know about this day? You know what? The weather here is beautiful. I don't think it's going to be the same. <laughs> okay, scratch. I don't know about your good weather. <laughs> jumping, I mean, my Christmas jumper. <laughs> oh. You, on the other hand, look like you just got off the beach. You look amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually really, really nice over here at the moment. So we, um, we've actually had loads of rain and then we've just moved into summer so I'm just embracing it embracing the beach look <laughs> beautiful beautiful so look before we get into our chat I would like to share with you some positive news is that okay yep go for it thank you so much so I saw some my news from my friends news from the rooftop and you can find them on Instagram and the reason why I like these guys is because they have news worth shouting about it's all about um, campaigns and issues that go on around the world and what they are doing to highlight the differences that are being made. So the news that I'm going to highlight today is all about plastic hangers. And I'll talk about how I used to sell these on a shopping channel in a moment. <laughs> but... <laughs> This is a really positive story because I've never given this any thought. And I'm, I, I, would, I really do feel that I'm a, a highly conscious person around plastic. But I didn't think about my plastic hangers. So, Nikki, there are new findings being literally shone a light on the impact of plastic hangers on the environment as an uh, eco-fashion industry agency they've offered a solution to the problem. So they're finding out that there are just so many negative impacts from plastic hangers, and they're working with a group of experts at Northumbria University. So according to this report, 60% of all clothes sold are sold with a plastic hanger. And as a result, each year, a staggering 954 million hangers are sold with clothing. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, that's really sad. Nikki, that's just in the UK. That is just in the UK. So the research is including interviews with C you know, senior fashion professionals, and they are suggesting that people are unaware of these issues, like you and I are. So this is obviously a thing. So nearly seven out of 10, that's 68%, were unaware what type of plastic is used in their hangers. So the way they're going about this is they're using a recycled and recyclable materials to make new hangers. And they are coming from marine and ocean bound post-consumer plastics that have been collected from the world's most polluted rivers. I mean, we see the pictures of them, don't we? these amazing countries and then you look at their rivers and washing up on their beaches is all the plastic and you're like oh gosh that's terrible 
I've got, I've got so many of these plastic hangers in my wardrobe and I'm like, right then, I've got to change up. I've got to change. Yeah. But it's what do you do with them? That's the whole point. Like loads of people have plastic hangers in their wardrobes, but what do you do with them now? How do you get rid of them safely? And so they don't just end up in that, well, they will end up in landfill, but is there a way of recycling or what's the way yeah. of doing it? This is the thing. So if you go on to uh, News from the Rooftop and have a look at this link, um, there is uh, Archhook, and this is the company that's actually working to make this difference. A quick Google as to what you can do with your plastic hangers might also help, but my first port for or port of call even, will be Archbook and have a look and see the work that they're doing and what I can do about this. Because, you know, I am a stickler for keeping my clothes hung up and hung neatly. I am, you know, I've got two stepdaughters. I'm not going to name and shame them, but, you know, it's like any teenagers, but they're 17 and 19 now. And all through the years I've known them, clothes are always on the floor. And I just don't get why you would put your clothes on the floor. I don't understand every item that I have gets hung up neatly in the wardrobe. I take so much pride in it. I, I know, but you look at your wardrobe. Your wardrobe is awesome. <laughs> I wouldn't be putting my clothes on the floor if they look like your clothes. <laughs> No, 95% of my clothes are charity, you know, so, but I look after absolutely everything, all the stuff that I used to spend bags and bags of money on, you know, I've looked after them and, um, you know, you and I have known each other, I was trying to count up and I believe it was 2003, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Long time, long time. We're both little tiny embryos. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Wow. So you will remember, Nikki, when I actually did my little shopping telly stint, because you've known me that long. You remember when I got my first job on, on shopping TV. We knew each other then. But I'm talking about when I used to work for QVC, and I was there... Um, their storage solutions expert and I was in my element you want shoes stored oh yeah I've got the solution for you you want to put your cutlery safe away you want to put your knives you want to put your hats you know you want to put your clothes and the hangers that I have now actually so I've not done too badly the hangers that I have I actually got when I worked at QVC and that was back in 2007. So I've had them a long time and they are still going strong. So at least I've got a lot of value out of them. And I don't have metal hangers. I only have things. Listen, I can talk about storage. <laughs> but it's a really good point. Like I have wooden ones and I really, I'm really glad that I have them. Um, but of, of course I've got plastic ones as well. So it does make you think. And one of the big things that I've found was um, moving. So obviously, you know, I moved from the UK to New Zealand in March yes. um, you know, when pandemic was, uh, was announced. Um, so I, so everything has been in a shipping container and it's traveled from the UK to New Zealand. I actually only got it last week. Oh my and God. as we opened up, yeah, as we opened up the container, not only have we found a whole new appreciation for everything that was in that container, um, but we actually started going through it and we realized like how much stuff we don't really use and what are we going to do with all of that stuff? And we've really become so eco-conscious since we've moved here. I think yeah. we always were, but since we moved here, we've really gone into it and we've done loads of research on what we buy to make sure that it's sustainable. And mm. um, over here, you know, even throwing things away, you get your, uh, rubbish collected every two weeks so you have to be really careful with what you throw away here because otherwise you know you just end up with loads of rubbish um, so it makes you really mindful and that is actually something we've had to look at is what do we now do with all this stuff that we've shipped over from the UK that we don't need here and how do we how do we dispose of it in a way mm. that doesn't you know doesn't end up in landfill for the next 100 years or yeah you know or longer. Your, your grandchildren to have to sort out basically yeah exactly yeah 
Right, Nikki, let me give the, the proper introduction so everybody knows. So you are a global career success coach. And I'm so proud to be able to say that because I've watched your journey from way back. <laughs> That before you even yeah. thought about doing that so you know you talked about moving to New Zealand and you know you're born in Britain which is where we met you and I but you know you and Jeremy your fiance did take that leap literally the borders were shutting on the UK and you must have got like the last flight out of Britain to get to New Zealand yeah pretty much was the last plane ride and yeah it you know, we have a really lovely relationship. We love each other deeply, but those 48 hours where he was convincing me to get on a plane and I refused point blank. I mean, if anybody walked past our house during that time, it was the domestic from hell. Like we were really, like, I was like, I'm not ready. I don't want to leave. I'm not leaving my, and I was like, I'm not leaving my home. Whereas at the same time, he's like, this is a global pandemic. I want to be home. Mm. So you know, we'd never really had this conversation before. We knew it's probably at some point we might move to New Zealand. Um, and he kept saying to me, give me five years, just give me five years in New Zealand. But we never expected it to be in 48 hours to make a snap decision, to book a plane ride. And um, and we joke about it now, but he, he, over those, well, over those 24 hours before we booked the plane ride, he, he would come over and talk to me and he would just check where I was in on the mood spectrum I think um and sometimes I'd be like nope we're not talking about it and I'd walk out the room and sometimes I go okay what do you how do we do this mm. um and he had to softly softly try and exp try and reason with me and try and talk about what our options were um and in the end I just said fine okay let's just go um so yeah so it's really bad but then after we booked the flight he then decided that he wanted to go um we then there was an announcement in new zealand at 5 a.m uk time from jacinda ardern to say that we had to be in the air on thursday night we had booked our flights on the friday morning um so then he then had to start again with could we just go to the airport a day early just to see if we can get on a plane um and so we did, we sat in Heathrow Airport until they could put us on a plane to get to Dubai. Um, and they had to phone up uh, New Zealand immigration to make sure that we were in a genuine relationship. Um, and luckily, because we'd traveled to New Zealand a couple of times before um, in our, uh, together, we were able to prove that we were a couple and he wasn't just, you know, taking me along as a refugee. Um, <laughs> and, and that's how we got over, but I mean, those 48 hours to make a snap decision, we left with two suitcases um, and we just packed thinking what we would need. And yeah, and thinking we would be back in June. We had a return flight coming back in June, um, thinking, oh yeah, it'll all be over by then. And yeah. obviously I now still can't leave the country because if I leave the country, I can't get back in. So Houses. yeah, Nick, it's interesting. Talk about a leap of faith. But, you know, I'm going to go on to my happy memories now. And, you know, I've known you since 2003. And I think I'll start with one of my happy memories, a recent one, and it involves Jeremy. Because I've known you for so long and I felt like, I could say like, yeah, mum, but I'd rather go with big sister. <laughs> yeah, definitely more a big sister. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've, I've pretty much met a lot of your boyfriends. I've met a lot of your boyfriends going along. And, you know, when you told me that you'd met Jeremy, I got good vibes straight away. I got good vibes just from you talking about him. And then you brought him on over to the valley where we live, to the start what we call our home, the valley. And you brought him in and... He was just so lovely. I love people who've got good manners. You know, I love people who are um, conversational straight away. He wasn't too much, but he wasn't too bad. Do you know what I mean? He was, yeah. he was just right. <laughs> it sounds like porridge. He was just... <laughs> and yeah, he yeah. really enjoyed such a lovely night. And I, I just felt like I'd known him for such a long time. And I could see that you were really happy and settled with Jeremy. So when you said, you know, he's planning to go back to New Zealand one of these days, and I thought, that's it, she'll be going. I just knew it. I knew you would go. 
And, you know, one of my happy memories is just you bringing Jeremy around here, me putting on music and dancing around and going bonkers and him not even batting an eyelid. That's when I knew that you were with the right person because if anybody can just watch me going bonkers. Going back in time now for another happy memory. <laughs> Do you remember when we used to work at Platform? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, loads of happy memories, but yes. Yeah. So I let you describe what Platform is because I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> So Platform was a music, it was every Sunday and it was in Covent Garden. Um, and I don't even know if the bar still exists, but um, no, yeah. I think it's where the Apple store or it used, where the Apple store is now, it was next to it. Um, yeah. And you used to go down the stairs and it would showcase live music every single, um, every single Sunday. And they were just amazing bands and they would come from everywhere. They mm. were just fantastic. And they would yeah. play and, um, and obviously you were the MC. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was just such a lovely atmosphere, just full of just really wonderful people. It was really, really good. Every single Sunday. Yeah. I can just embellish upon that. It was, Platform was the name of uh, our, our, I was going to say our night, but it was a daytime thing. You know, it started at about one in the afternoon. It was for up and coming bands, unsigned artists. And it was on the legendary Rock Garden stage. So the same stage that the Rolling Stones had played on, for instance, you know, massive, massive groups. And, um, you, you know, the Kooks came along one Sunday. They, it was before they even got big. They weren't on our list. And I just remember the lead singer coming up to me and saying, um, hey, any chance that we could play here? I'm like, well, we kind of full for today, but you can come back. He said, well, we just want to do one, you know, and there's just something about them. And this is before they broke big. I went, yeah, no problem. So I introduced them. I said, okay, we've got a new band. They're called the Kooks. And then I like, did that. And everybody was like, yeah. And they finished. They were like, awesome. And then about a week later, they just broke. It was like, damn, I have a Kooks on stage. Yeah. <laughs> they were the Kooks. But yeah. My funny memory of platform because you were at the door, you were on the door, weren't you? You were taking the money, and uh, I remember I left. Um, <laughs> I was reading um, a Buddhist book, and I left it on the table. And if anybody has ever been to the Rock Garden, yeah, the stairs. He came down the stairs, and it was pretty dark, and no health and safety for us. Oh no, there were lots of candles everywhere. And I don't know if you remember this, Nikki. I don't know if you remember, but my book was just on the um, on the desk where you were sitting, and one of the candles fell on it and caught a light. Do you remember that? I don't remember that. No. Okay. So yeah, that book, Nikki, is here. Oh, I think I do now. Yeah, I don't remember it going up, up, but yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. It was like a candle fell on it. And, you know, this is my Buddhist book. And this is yes, like, I do remember. The writings, you know, I shouldn't really take it out of the house. But, you know, I'm enjoying reading it. The weight of this thing. And it caught light. But to me, you know, love that. I love that. That's life. That's life, you know. Memories, yeah. But you helped put it out. You know, you were like, you were like, you are helping to put it out. The other memory, now I don't usually have like a couple of happy memories with people that I speak to here, but I've got loads with you. And one of the ones now, because I don't remember if you and I met at this job that I'm now going to tell you about, or that platform, I can't remember. But do you remember the, was it called photo ID or fashion ID? Yeah. And that's how we met. We met that's on how we met. job. Right. Yeah. We met there and then we didn't talk and then I bumped into you in Clapham South on the Tubes platform and that's when we spoke about platform. <laughs> that's oh my God. probably where I came up with the name because behind me I'm doing some recycling. I've got the old shredder behind me and I found the old contract that I signed where I sold the name oh. for the platform to Lisa. Oh, no way. 
I found it just the other day and I was about to shred it and I thought, no, I'm going to keep it actually. I'm going to keep it. Yeah. That's lovely. So, but do you remember this job? Now, I'm not going to remember names, but the guy, it was the guy and his partner, he had really, really white blonde hair, didn't he? Yeah. And he used to wear massive wedge shoes. They were like big bricks on the bottom of his feet. They were black. Yep. Kids, something out of the Matrix, yeah. And this was like early 2000s. And you and I were skin. We were so skin back then. But we used to go out onto the streets of the UK, so around London and Surrey areas and... Actually, I think we got as far as Basildon one time. Basildon sticks in my mind because you were like, I cannot do this anymore. I've had enough. I hate this. Yeah. I think that was intent, actually. I think at that point I was like, I'm done. That's it. And yeah, I just didn't believe in it. And I find actually that's one of the big things I've always come back down to is I have to believe what I'm selling. And I just didn't. I got to a point where I just didn't believe it anymore. I didn't mm -hmm. want to sell it. I just didn't yeah. feel right doing it. Yeah. Because we, we were really... on the street spotting women, young women or young guys, and we were selling them the, the photographic experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it was, I mean, you know, it was like one of those jobs. And, but we had each other and we used to make each other laugh. And, you know, there were times when we were like, this is awful. We have got to get out of this. But we, we would, you know, there were no tears, but we would be like, we are determined. We will look back and we will laugh at these days. But the guy, I don't know if he was German or Swiss or whatever, but he was really ambitious. And it was just his boots and his long coat. He had a real Matrix vibe. <laughs> he did. It was, it was interesting. It was definitely a, um, yeah, definitely a welcome to the job world for me because I was, Oh, I just started, I was at uni at that point. So, you know, it, other than working in retail and working in shops, that was kind of a way of making extra money at that point. And yeah, I just remember just thinking how, it was the very first time that I had that, how great, you know, how great is the pain of doing this? As in, do I really, is it worth feeling, you know, like crap basically during the day? Um, just to hope to make some money. And that was the thing, we were on commission only. So yeah, yeah. it was, yeah. Look back at all of those times. And I just think it's what makes you who you are to toughen up this thing and go for it. Because, you know, you're a global success career coach now. And, you know, you've got your podcast winning at work and you're just so great at it. And you've got loads of experience that you're sharing with people and it, it's making people's lives better. So all of those experiences, you know, I never want to get rid of any of them. Oh, no, I wouldn't change it for the absolute world. I really wouldn't. And I do feel that now when I'm doing the coaching and I'm working with people and um, talking to, and I work with quite a few companies now, and it's really interesting, you know, when people say things to you, you now realize how much those experiences have changed who you are. And I don't think I'll ever be in a situation where someone says, you don't know what you're talking about. Cause I'll say, well, name a job that I haven't done. <laughs> You know, I pretty much have done it all now. So, yes, running, yeah. Kew Gardens. Yeah. I, oh, gosh. I remember you working all kind of places, but I love your strap line, turning a rat race into a happy place. I love that. <laughs> love it. It's so true. So many people are unhappy at work. I just, mm. I just, and I was one of those people. I, I went from job to job to job didn't enjoy any of them, worked for ages just because I thought that I wanted the money and the lifestyle. And, you know, I, then when I started doing coaching, I then went into not earning the same amount of money that I was earning when I worked in a law firm, for instance. And, but the amount of happiness has made up for not making, I, I, I don't care anymore. It's not so much that your money motivated, it's about seeing the change that you're making yeah. and, and knowing that you're doing something that you enjoy, I think. That's, yeah that's made a huge difference and I know there's bills to pay and of course like I'm still paying them you know now I have a mortgage whereas before it was like it was rent which seemed 
I don't know, kind of a little bit more relaxed. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, but you, but now I think I've realized that I don't, well, I don't have, I don't spend money to make myself feel better, which is what I think I did before. Um, so yeah, yeah that's the difference. Yeah, I realized that I spend more because I don't feel like I need to fill a, a hole that, that I probably had when I worked in corporate. Um, mm. And I don't diss corporate at all for loads of people. That's great. And I've spoken to people, you know, when I work through coaching, it's all about what your values are. Mm. And there's been people that have said to me, but I am money motivated. I need to make this amount of money every month. And if that's how you feel, then by all means, keep going for it. That's what, that's one of your, you know, that's one of your priorities. That's one of your values. That's what you want to work towards. Great. Um, but when I realized that wasn't what I wasn't money motivated in that way, mm. everything changed because then I, I'm only working to what suits me and who I am. Yeah, it's Absolutely. really- Absolutely. Cool. This is why we are friends, because you and I both kind of have the same kind of code of practice in life, which is how can I create value? How can I make a difference? And we like traveling light through this world. We don't like an amount of stress on our shoulders. So it is important for us to do what we love and you are naturally doing the right job for you right now. I do the jobs that I do for me that are right for me, where I'm changing people's lives, you know, whether it's working with young people in schools or working with stroke survivors or, you know, working to um, working on campaigns with young people so they can get into great jobs. These are the things I'm naturally good at. People, we like people. We're people persons. People, people. <laughs> exactly. Big time. Yeah. It's just having the confidence to go for what you want rather than feel that you have to do what everybody around you is telling you to do. That's Absolutely right. So, Nikki, it is time for your show and tell. <laughs> what you got? So, meet Tibbs. Wow. See, you're already happy. You're already happy because you've seen him. Done. <laughs> um, so Tibbs, uh, a little story about Tibbs. So Tibbs has come with me everywhere I've basically been. Um, and when I, so when we spoke about doing this, I then got the, I'll keep him in. Um, I then got the... <laughs> Um, I then got the con uh, our shipping container and I opened it up. And the moment that I saw him, I was oh. like, oh, this is huge. And I got he really, really happy. You left yeah, to without tips. I know, I did leave him behind. But he he's travelled by ship. I mean, it's pretty cool. It's old school, but pretty cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he's got a really good story. So I've had him since I was a child. Um, I am ridiculously close to my grandma. Like, probably closer to her than I probably am to my own mum. And it's my mum's mum. So when she she actually um, got very, very sick, I can't remember how many years ago now, I think I've blocked it out of my memory, but she, um, but unfortunately she passed away um, mm -hmm. from a sort of, yeah, you know, like a brain aneurysm. Um, and she, I gave her, when she found out that she, she had, um, she had a fall, say it before um and that's how they then found out that she um you know had problems in the brain and then they gave her you know a certain amount of time to live um but when this all happened I gave her tips and I said look look after tips for me mm. and obviously when she passed away tips then came back to me so mm. tips has like had a really really cool little life um but one of the big things and so I know that it probably sounds quite morbid but it actually isn't because now I have this beautiful bear that I now take everywhere. And the happiness that I saw when I, when I opened up that container and saw him, I was like, oh, this is big. Like he like, hey, I like then put him in his own room. He's now got his own room in this house. Um, <laughs> Hang on, Nikki. If I travel by ship to New Zealand, will you put me up in my own room? Because I've seen your house. It's very nice. <laughs> yes, you will. You will. There's a room already available. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so he makes me very very happy and just even telling the story just makes me really happy because yeah it's just a really lovely story and since she passed away my belief like how I feel about people 
dying has completely changed and I've become a lot more factual about it I'm a lot more okay with it and I just feel like we've all got to go through this process we've all got to go through this sadly some people pass away sooner than others and this is just unfortunately really really painful and really hard but actually everybody's got their journey and their part to play in life and I don't know it completely changed everything of how I feel and sort of made me seize the moment that I'm here to be honest so yeah oh Nikki I love his lips and I've got to say he looks absolutely put the camera again you haven't smelled him (laughs) thank god it's not smell a vision (laughs) it's kind of stinky (laughs) He needs to go in the washing machine, I'm sure. But um, yeah, he's good. He's good. I like him. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing him to me. Do you know, um, I have back at home in Coventry at my mum's a massive yellow teddy that I was given when I was about one years of age. I don't remember being given it. I just know this teddy's always been in my life and um, he's well rough. <laughs> I mean, you know, this teddy is lived in. I think... I'm a, I mean, it was it was huge. This thing, you know. If I was, I don't know, I'm not good with sizes, but off the ground, <laughs> no foot, a foot tall, maybe this teddy was. And um, you know, his little chest is all worn, and his arms, and I would say he's still got his eyes and his nose and his little mouth. But I think I slept on it. You know, I cried on it. I laughed on it, I jumped on it, played on it. He's really worn, this teddy. And then next to him is another teddy that I actually got from my aunt Elaine when I was about four or five, and I actually do remember receiving it because it's got a wind-up key in the back. Yeah. Music. And he's dark brown, and again, he's a little lived in, but I've looked after him, and I've still got him, and it still plays the music. Still plays. Oh. So, you know, I'll be going home to see my, my family soon, and, um, you know, I'll be back with my teddies. So I'll say hey from Mr. Tips. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is it. Like, I think I didn't realise, like, when you get teddies and things as a child, you know, you have always your favourite toy, and I... And I've watched Toy Story. It makes me cry every time. <laughs> but it's actually really funny that as you get older, you start to go, oh, like they have memories and yeah. you take them through with you. And yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it just means so much. And then it's kind of that whole thing where you sort of go and then it gets passed on to our children. And um, uh, we're really lucky in New Zealand. We uh, have a really low rate of coronavirus so we don't have lockdown or anything like that um, but we went out and over here which I don't know if it happens in the UK but because I've lived in London for so long it mm. might just be different. Um, but you go and see your tree before you cut it down and you go to the tree farm and you pick your Christmas tree I and they put a little tag on it. I liked your picture yeah. on Instagram I saw it. <laughs> so we picked our eight foot tree um which was hilarious and then they put a little tag around it and then you t- and then you come back a couple of weeks later and the tree's probably grown a little you know a few centimeters and then they cut it down and you take it with you and that's that's like a tradition that loads of people do every year you go wow. to the tree farm you pick your tree a few weeks later you go and pick it up no one is allowed to pick up their tree prior to the first of december so you um but i think that's because it's so hot so everything starts yeah. to wilt a lot <laughs> um so yeah so it's a real like tradition and you see loads of families going out so with like these like really small kids carrying like this 10 foot pole just like <laughs> really? so, so really cute but um yeah so i've never done anything like that before so i felt like a kid uh, literally a kid at christmas um <laughs> so it's been really gorgeous. nikki it just sounds like you have literally just embedded yourself in the New Zealand culture I heard a little twang of the accent coming through a little bit as well but it looks looks like New Zealand life is really agreeing with you yeah you know I I was really apprehensive before I went and I just thought I've got nothing to lose worst case scenario we can always get on a plane and come home well not so much now but that was always the plan um and I really have like I 
Um, some people have, have asked about moving to New Zealand. Like I'm part of Facebook groups that talk about moving to New Zealand. And one of the big things that I keep saying to people is that you just have to travel with an open mind. You mm. can't compare it. I, I can never compare New Zealand to London. Um, it's just worlds apart. Um, and there'll be some things that you like, some things that you don't like. Um, yeah, but I just find that you just have to just go with an open mind and just feel that you are, you just have to embrace everything that the country has to offer. Right. So it's, it's cool. I'm really enjoying it. Nikki, I wouldn't have let you go with Jeremy unless I knew that it would be right for you. I just, I just knew it would be great for you. And so, you know, even I miss physically having you, but then look at that. We're not physically with anybody. So it kind of worked out all right because <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to physically see you anyway. But I feel we see more of each other now than you're on the other side of the planet. I think that's always the way though, isn't it? Because you make more of an effort when to see people when they're not in yeah. the same town or the same city. So yeah, I've really noticed that as well. And I think it's easier for me to be away because every no one's able to see each other. It'll be when yeah. everyone's out and catching up and and I'm watching it from the other side of the world that I might be a little bit homesick. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, it's it's kind of still like being being in the same in the same well we're on the same planet at least so. <laughs> Nikki, it's just been fantastic to talk to you you're in the future you're a day ahead in the future so I'll, I'll never catch you up but honestly I just send you so much love and send loads of love to Jeremy as well give him a big hug for me oh, love to everyone in your and your family and the girls and to Lawrence as well and yeah we will be back we will be back next year if we can you know pandemic willing so um yeah so hopefully we will catch up in person soon <laughs> all right thanks again nikki thank you thanks thank you so much nikki coming in all the way from hamilton new zealand my good old friend on the other side of the planet, but just felt like she was right there. So wonderful to share a happy talk with her. So now it's time for your happy happenings. So um, this is an incredible happy happenings and I'm involved in this one. <laughs> this one is being shared by Jason Rossum, who is the founder of Riverside Radio. Riverside Radio started um, seven years ago and started off as Wandsworth Radio. Started off in a studio above the Oasis um, charity shop on Battersea Bridge Road. And, you know, it's gone through so much in that time and we've attracted um, loads of volunteers. And I've been there since the beginning with my Kids All Right show. And I've gone from Mondays to Thursdays to Fridays and now Saturdays. And, you know, the format, the programming, the hey, loads of events that we've done, the outside broadcast, you know, everything we've been involved with, the Arts Watch and the sports news, the music, the new music that we've launched on Riverside Radio has been incredible. And in 2020, we became finally a DAB station and it's just been brilliant to you know get to this point and the exciting news that affects so many of us in the Riverside Radio community is that we are the digital radio station of the year. That is huge news, absolutely mad news. I'm just so, so, so happy for everybody involved, for the loads of work that Jason and uh, the team have put in and all the volunteers to be so diligent and committed and even in this time of a global pandemic to keep on bringing fresh material, new music, guests and to win this award at the end of 2020. So yay us! <laughs> So if you have any happy happenings for me, then please do send them 
to happy talk with Fayon Dixon at gmail.com and I'll put them right here. And I'd just like to say, you know, thanks to everybody that's been on the show. I've really enjoyed it. And I look forward to welcoming another guest next week. Take care.